uh, if you uh, consider your gender as a man or your gender as a woman, a lot of things that come into play with you being a man or a woman are what society puts into these two categories. Like for example, a man is good at sports or a woman is good at cooking or a man would rather prefer a color like blue or, or whereas a woman would prefer a color like pink. So sex is biology. Gender comes through from society. Uh, that is the main difference between these two. Uh, so uh, moving on. Uh, sorry, uh, sexual orientation is, uh, can be referred to as who you are attracted to. So for example, if I am a woman and I am attracted to a man and a man only, I uh, can be defined or labeled as a heterosexual woman. Whereas if I am a woman who is attracted to another woman, I would be, uh, I can carry the label lesbian. Uh, and if I am a woman who is attracted to both men and women, uh, I could fit into the category of bisexual, which means the attraction to two genders, bi as in two, uh, and attracted to two genders. Asexual is also another sexual orientation where you are not attracted to any gender. Uh, this is not a sickness or uh, an incapacity in people. It's just how people are born. Uh, sometimes you can be attracted to people of the same gender. Sometimes you can be attracted to people of the opposite gender. Sometimes you can be attracted to people of the same gender and the opposite gender. You can also not have any attraction to anybody at all. And that is completely valid and completely normal. Moving on. Can we? Okay, so if uh, most of you must have wondered uh, if you don't have a proper idea about what the LGBT community means, uh, you could have wondered why there are so many acronyms, for example, what is LGBTIQA? So if we go one by one, uh, as I've mentioned here in my screen, L means lesbian, G means gay, B means bisexual, T transgender, I intersex, Q queer, and A asexual. So why this, uh, can we move to the previous slide for this? Uh, yeah, the one with the alphabet soup. So why these uh, I, names are there are for you to understand who you are and for you to be comfortable uh, fitting into a certain category for you to have this sense of belonging. But that also does not mean you have to absolutely categorize into one of these labels. You don't have to put a label on yourself. You can just be as you are and be attracted to who you are attracted to or like who you like. These are just uh, labels or categories that have been provided for you to feel comfortable or for you to feel included uh, into something. Okay, moving on. So as I explained before, a lesbian is a woman who is emotionally and or physically attracted to other women. This can mean you are either sexually attracted to a woman, or you are romantically attracted to a woman, or you are both sexually and romantically attracted to a woman. Uh, gay means uh, a person who is uh, physically and emotionally attracted to members of the same sex. Uh, sometimes people in the LGBT community use gay as a word to identify everybody. Uh, so anyone in the LGBT community can call themselves I am gay. So it's like an umbrella term that a lot of people use. But if you are talking about the term gay uh, in particular, gay means a man who is attracted uh, physically, emotionally or romantically to another man. Um, Bisexual, uh, as I mentioned, is a person who is attracted to both men and women. But this also does not mean that a bisexual person always needs to have uh, a male partner and a female partner 
at the same time. It just means that they have the capacity to be attracted to either men, women, or people of other genders. Uh, so it also does not mean that bisexual people have a better tendency to cheat on their partner or they can't make a choice. It just means that you uh, ha have the possibility to be attracted to other uh, people of other genders. So just because a bisexual person is in a relationship with uh, a person of the same gender does not mean that they cannot be attracted to people of the opposite gender. For example, if I am a woman and if I am bisexual and I am dating a boy, that does not mean I am any less bisexual. I am just in a relationship with a man, but I am still always going to be bisexual. So this is a diagram I put up for uh, you guys to understand uh, this, uh, all of these terms better. So here you can see on the first uh, person, it's, we call it the gender bred person, the dude in um, yellow. So in your brain, your brain is where your identity is. That is where you figure out whether you are a man or you're a woman or whether you don't want to identify yourself as a man or a woman. The heart is referred to as who you are attracted to. Uh, and the sex is referred to as the biological sex that you are born with, uh, aka your genitals. Your expression is how you show yourself. So how these can be different is, let's take me for an example. Uh, if I think in, in this identity section, if I think that I am a woman uh, and I am attracted to people of the opposite gender. So I am a woman, I am attracted to men. My expression can be different from me being a woman. I could express myself in a masculine way. I could dress up very masculine, even though I am a woman, but that has nothing to do with my identity. I just like expressing myself in a masculine way. I like uh, wearing, uh, I don't know, stereotypically masculine clothing. Uh, but I am still and always will be a woman. The same thing happens if you're a man uh, and you like, uh, you are attracted to women, but you also like putting on makeup or you like uh, wearing clothes uh, with, in the color pink, which, are, which is stereotypically not assigned as a masculine color, but you're still a man even though you like to put makeup, even though you like to wear skirts, even though you I don't know, like uh, arts, literature, dancing, whatever society tells you is not masculine, you are still a man. It's just the way that you express yourself. Uh, okay, moving on. So uh, this is all of what I said, uh, put in uh, an easy circle for you guys to understand. So sexual orientation can be heterosexual, which is you're attracted to people of the opposite gender. For example, if I'm a woman, I'm attracted to a man. If there's a man, he's attracted to a woman that is heterosexual. Homosexual is if you're attracted to people of the same gender. Like if I'm a woman and I'm attracted to a woman, then I am a homosexual woman. And bisexual, if you're attracted to more, like people of two genders. Pansexual, if you're attracted to people of more gender. Sex, you have male, female, intersex. Uh, I will explain what intersex is later. Uh, gender expression is how you show yourself, how you express yourself, how you dress, how you talk, the things you know that you do. So it can be masculine, feminine, uh, or androgynous. Gender identity is what you think in your brain. Am I a man? Am I a woman? Uh, or am I trans? So uh, can we move on? Okay. So gender identity uh, is, uh, like I said, what, who you think you are in your head. Do I feel more like a man or do I feel more like a woman? Or do I not fit into a man or a woman? Or do I feel like a man and a woman at the same time? Uh, I know it might be uh, confusing to understand if this is the first time you are hearing of it, but 
in society, man and a woman are not the two only genders. There are different kinds of genders across different spectrums that people identify with or people confine to. And not everybody identifies as either a man or a woman. It's not binary at all. It's very complex. Um, moving on. So this, I want you guys to take a moment. This is a gender spectrum, gender identity spectrum. So let's think, uh, as society says, in one, you have a Barbie. And in 12, you have G.I. Joe. So typically, Barbie is considered to be this very graceful, very pretty, beautiful uh, girl who is very feminine, has long hair, beautiful you know, gowns uh, and all of that. And G.I. Joe is this very masculine hunky dude, you know, who can like carry you on his shoulders and things like that. But we don't always either, we are not Barbie or G.I. Joe. We don't fit into either one or 12. We are somewhere in between. Like I could be a woman who likes to dress in men's clothes or who likes to cut my hair uh, or do things like that, right? Whereas if you're a man, I don't think every single man is a gym bro or like goes to the gym is always, you know, engaging in stereotypically male activities. So you are always somewhere in between. Like for example, if you're a man, like gardening, gardening is stereotypically a woman's, you know, activity, you know, like make planting flowers, things like that. But you still like it, right? So does that make you any less of a man? No, it does not. And if you're a man and if you cry, does that make you a woman? It absolutely does not. You are still a man whether you cry or not. It's just the way that you express yourself. It's just the way that you show your concerns. And if you're a man who is more like, who likes kids, who likes taking care of children, uh, who likes cooking, all of those things, you are still always a man. It's just your likes. You lie between this spectrum. And even if you're a woman and you don't uh, do stereotypically feminine uh, things, like let's say you're a woman who does not like makeup or you're a woman who is very much into sports, weightlifting, things like that, you are still nevertheless a woman. These are just your interests and you know where you fall in this spectrum. Uh, so what I'm trying to say through this is nobody is in one and nobody is in 12. We are all complex, different humans with mixed you know, attributes. Society is the uh, thing that tells us that you have to do this if you're a man or you have to do this if you're a woman. But no, you don't have to because like we are not either this or that. We are all different. We have different likes. We have different things that we relate to. So... Uh, that is what I want to say from this diagram. So when we talk about transgender people, uh, I hope you guys can identify at least some of the people I put up on this slide. Uh, we have uh, Bhumi Harendran, she's from Sri Lanka, Lavan Cox, Elliot recently came out. Uh, so can we? Uh, what transgender means is a person whose gender, again, gender is in your brain, not in your genitals, uh, is different from the sex that has been assigned to you at birth. So, for example, if I, when I was born, I was born with a penis, but as I grow older, I realize that I identify as a woman. So, there is a clash between uh, you know, you being a woman in your head and you having male genitals. So this can be called as transgender. If uh, what, Because society says that if you're a woman, you need to have a vagina. If you're a man, you need to have a penis. So when people are born, where these two don't match, where your brain and your genitals don't match, uh, these people can be considered transgender. But this uh, transgender and sexual orientation are not the same thing. Transgender people can be heterosexual, they can be lesbian, they can be gay, they can be bisexual. Uh, so moving on. 
So there's a uh, transgender men and a uh, previous transgender women. So a transgender man is uh, a person who identifies as male, but when they were born, they had female sex characteristics. So in very simple terms, this is a man who was born with a vagina, but identifies as a man. Uh, and so you also call that female to male or FTM. A transgender woman is the opposite. It's a woman who was assigned with male genitals at birth, but identifies as a woman. So these people may or may not, depending on what they want, go through surgeries to fix their appearance. But then again, there is no standard that says you have to go through surgery to be trans. Uh, because surgery also depends on certain people's economic status, financial status, also personal preferences and dislikes. Uh, so yeah, next. So uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is just to say that transgender people have existed for a long time in the world. They are uh, have our uh, religious stories related to trans people, especially in Indian cultures. Uh, there are uh, uh, cultural associations uh, with trans people. So these identities have been uh, in different, different countries in so many uh, ways and so many forms. Uh, but most of these things were taken away or erased after colonization. Even in Sri Lanka, before colonization, there were a lot of uh, homosexual acts, when you say acts like, there were gay people, there were people engaging in homosexual behaviors, there were people uh, who had these kind of relationships. But through colonization, this was uh, considered or categorized as gross indecency. And then after that, uh, put into the penal code under article 365 and 365A, which criminalized these acts. So. Again, this was something that was always there in our cultures. It was just the Victorian culture and colonization that took away these aspects because for uh, these Westerners who came to colonize our countries, at that time, they thought we were being uncivilized or savages or engaging in gross behaviors. So again, to emphasize these identities have always existed. It has just been erased. So intersex, uh, like you remember in the beginning, I said uh, sex is male, female, or intersex. So uh, male sex is if you have a penis as your biological genitals. Female sex is if you have a vagina in your biological genitals. But there are also people who are born with extra genitalia or uh, internal reproductive systems, which would then classify them as neither exclusively male or female. So these people can sometimes, when they are born itself, have the presence of both a vagina and a penis in them. Sometimes these people could have a penis externally, but they could also have a, a female reproductive system inside them. So these are biological characteristics. They could have differences in chromosomes, you know, uh, they could not just have X, X or XY chromosomes. Their chromosomes could differ. So uh, they are born with these characteristics. These individuals uh, can be referred to as intersex. Okay, so uh, I, that was the end of uh, my discussion, but I will be addressing some myths and misconceptions. Uh, I, oh, yeah. Shailini, I yes, so. uh, yes, uh, I was actually about to address the same uh, thing as your uh, presentation was going. Like, clearly, like, this is something very nuanced and there are a lot of, like, uh, subtleties and differences between uh, each group of LGBTIQ community and not everyone is privy to this knowledge and there are so many myths and misconceptions, like, uh, and there are maybe other challenges that people of this community 
are facing due to the misconceptions and myths and the stigma coming out of that. So if you could very briefly uh, tell us like in a nutshell, what are these myths and myth, myth, misconceptions and like the challenges that the LGBTIQ community face? Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, I have only noted down a couple of these uh, myths and misconceptions, but please do feel free to send us any questions you have. I'm pretty sure either Shanti or I would definitely be glad to help you resolve your issues. Uh, no question is a stupid question. Uh, can we uh, move to the previous one, Shilani? Yeah, so uh, sometimes uh, people say that being transgender is an illness. Uh, people say, why do you want to change the gender that you were born in? You know, uh, why is that necessary? For what? Like you were already born in a certain body. Why can't you, you know, be happy in your body? But no, being trans is not an illness. Again, like I said, your sex is not the same as your gender, which is in your brain, your sex, which is in your genitals. So in 2018, the WHO also removed a trans-related categories from mental disorders. So it is not a disorder, it is not an illness, it is completely normal and natural. In some cultures, in some countries, trans people are actually revered at a very high standard because trans people are uh, believed to be the link between men and women and therefore they have a higher status than men and women because they are uh, able to experience uh, the connection of both the genders. So they are actually regarded highly in some cultures. Next. Uh, okay, so another myth that comes out is that homosexuality is unnatural. Most of the time when people say it is unnatural, that's because uh, people believe that uh, homosexual people cannot have children and therefore there is no reason for them to be together because if you can't procreate you can't okay. somebody is talking could we please uh i don't know if it's sorry okay um so uh, as i was saying uh but not everybody gets married or not everybody falls in love and not everybody is together to have children. Like for example, there can be women who are infertile and therefore they cannot bear children. There can be men who have problems with procreation for, and therefore they can't have uh, children too. And there may also be people who are married who just simply don't want to have children. But does that mean these two people shouldn't be together? Absolutely not because getting married or falling in love or being together is about the two of you. Uh, so in the same way, uh, people uh, in same-sex relationships do not have to procreate or have uh, kids uh, for their marriage to be valid. And also in a lot of countries where homosexuality is not criminalized, a lot of LGBT couples adopt children that have been uh, not accepted or put into orphanages by heterosexual people. And therefore they help these kids as well to have a loving home. So, uh, and also uh, more than 450 uh, species of animals uh, engage in same sex behavior as well. So even like biological, through biological phenomenon, it is not unnatural at all. Um, next. So another myth and a myth of uh, previous, please. Another uh, misconception is that gay men are very feminine or uh, lesbian women are very masculine. Uh, but this is not true. Like people in the LGBT com community are different diverse people. You cannot stereotype a man who looks a little bit feminine and be like, oh, that's gay. Like, I'm pretty sure even in like conversations between friends and stuff, people must say, dude, that's gay. Or like, you know, do why would you do that? Things like that. But you're only gay if you're attracted to someone of uh, the same gender. 
uh, not if you act a certain way, not if you talk a certain way, not if you dress a certain way. None of that has anything to do with the, whether you're gay or not. So uh, even uh, heterosexual people dress in different ways. Uh, but that doesn't mean they are gay or anything else. It's just that they just like dressing up. So next slide. Um, okay. So in uh, this, uh, so the, in the first picture, you can see it's Brad Pitt in a dress. Uh, does that make him any less of a man? No, is Brad Pitt gay? Not that I know of, he hasn't come out or anything, but he identifies as a straight man, but he's wearing a dress. So straight men wear dresses too. Does that make them gay? No, it does not. Uh, so in the second picture you have, I forgot his name, but he was in prison break. He has openly come out as gay, but he is not feminine or effeminate, but still does not mean that he's not gay. Uh, and Christian Stewart uh, has also come out as gay. Uh, but she dresses in different, different ways. So your uh, sexual orientation has no say in who you're attracted to. Uh, and in this photo with uh, Pink and her husband and her daughter, she dresses uh, very masculine. She has short hair. She's in the picture itself, she's dressed in a suit, but she identifies as straight. So I'm just trying to show that different people can be I can dress in different ways and it has nothing to do with who they're attracted to. In the next picture, you can see a Fiona and her partner. Fiona was a this is Petunia in a Harry Potter. So uh, you can see how different people are different and how they dress different ways and how that has nothing to do with who they are, or who they are attracted to. Angelina Jolie and Megan Fox have both come out as bisexual, but they don't stereotypically dress with short hair or anything like that. It's just who they are. And it's completely normal. Moving on. So uh, these are just a list of famous LGBT people in history that I put out uh, because being LGBT or being gay didn't just come out in the modern age. Gay people have always existed in history throughout times. Socrates, Aristotle, Michelangelo, uh, Alexander the Great, Alan Turing. I would definitely recommend The Enigma Code, a movie if you have time to watch uh, about him uh, helping uh, to break the Enigma Code and uh, how much uh, things he has done for modern day technology. Uh, writers like William Shakespeare, Oscar Wilde, Virginia Woolf, uh, and also musicians, Ricky Martin, uh, Elton John, uh, also actors like Jim Parsons, uh, who was in Big Bang Theory as Shelton. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is LGBT people are not a different set of people. We are all people, just people living in the same community. And if you think, oh, we didn't have this back much in, in the day, but like now only people are coming out and you know, everybody's gay someday, every day some new person is telling saying that they are gay. No, like they've always existed. It's just that nowadays you won't get killed or assaulted as much as before if you come out as gay. So you don't have to live in fear of your identity. You don't have to worry about uh, being assaulted or your rights being violated if you come out. The freedom is what gives these people the access to be themselves. It's the same thing as when we say, uh, oh, like earlier in the days, parents or grandparents had really good marriages, but nowadays only people are getting divorced. But no, earlier in the days, your grandparents or whoever, your grandmother probably stayed with your grandfather because she had no other choice. She didn't have a chance of earning money. She didn't have a way of telling people of the abuse that was going on. And also society never accepted divorce as an option. But now because divorce is an option and we are encouraging people not to stay in abusive relationships, there are more divorces happening. So it's not like these things didn't happen. It's just that now you are free to express yourself. Um, so moving on. Uh, that, that's, that's all for my presentation. Yes. Um, I think if we take all the questions at the end of the session, that would be uh, better in the interest of time as well. 
Um, so next up, uh, we have our second speaker, the other speaker. I will first introduce uh, her to you all, although she may not be a stranger to many of you. Um, we have Shanuki D. Alvis. Uh, she is by day a brand purpose and course communications consultant, where she integrates a 20 years of experience in advertising and brand communications with a passion for local courses in collaboration with corporates, NGOs, and institutions. Uh, she's also a skills coach and trainer, freelance creative director, public speaker, and well-known theater practitioner, a TEDx speaker, and a popular podcaster. She's the creator and host of the award-winning program, Sri Lanka's first English and community talk show that addresses the social stigmas and gender empowerment narratives, uh, which is a passion project for her. And it earned a recognition as an alternative voice for social justice by the Global I Pro Bono Movement and an SLT01 award for community empowerment. Outside her consulting work, uh, she uses her exp brand building experience to offer mentorship to startup entrepreneurs in collaboration with Hatch Global. So we warmly welcome uh, Shanuki to the platform. So just to uh, like summarize what Tarindi said, Tarindi um, basically introduced us to the concept of LGBTIQ and what uh, like each uh, group LGBTIQ uh, group identifies and what are the differences and the challenges they face, myths and misconception about the community. So now we are moving on to the part about how the rest of the society, the white society, uh, uh, the society's perspective of them and how the society can um, act as an ally um, in supporting this community because obviously this, this entire series of sessions are part of building support to the LGBTIQ community through accessing or giving access to information about it. So we'd like Shanuki uh, to talk about how we, as an ally to them, uh, what what kind of things that we can do as allies. Can I be heard? Yes. Can you, okay. Uh, hi guys, uh, sorry, I'm just like in the middle of a lot of things right now. Um, so here's the thing, this, this LGBTQI and the rest of the alphabet thing. Uh, I know that uh, I, I know that they are differentiators and they are a terminology that is used to identify people or how how people identify themselves. But very honestly, when I was growing up, I had no knowledge of any of this. Right, this is all stuff that sort of in my twenties. Uh, started coming out on media and I started wondering, oh, uh, so what does gay mean? Or what does, I mean, yeah, I was actually 20 years old when I <laughs> heard about uh, homosexuality and, you know, gay people and lesbians, and, you know, and it, it just, um, it, it boggled my mind to think, okay, why, why do we have uh, this label for this person and that label for that person? And, and really, um, I think one of the privileges of growing up in a world where there were no labels was that I saw everyone for who they were as people, as, um, as their personalities, as what they brought to the table, how they contributed to my life, how they added value to the world. And sometimes I wish whilst we do have these terminologies and they're very important because it helps, it helps people um, who, uh, to identify who, uh, who they are. And it helps us to also be more sensitized uh, to their specific, you know, uh, lived experiences. Um, I do think sometimes it creates a label uh, of sorts that uh, the minute you sort of, and I'm talking from a point of view of a straight ally, uh, this is a truth that I've seen in the world. Um, and is when you say somebody is, homosexual. For instance, if you say that girl is a lesbian, we have this tendency as society to immediately, that's the kind of label we see on them. We, we cease to see anything else about them except the fact that somebody has told us that they are a lesbian. And then what happens is our entire mentality or psychology towards that person is colored by the fact that we know she's a lesbian. Um, so sometimes I wonder whether identifying them or identifying ourselves as LGBTQI or straight is actually necessary. Um, as an ally, 
in, and it is a personal viewpoint. Uh, and I'm sure that members of the community themselves may not agree. They might they might take great pride uh, in, in being identified as uh, who they are, which is great. But for me as an ally, I feel like I don't want to know. I don't want to know if you're gay. I don't want to know if you're bisexual. I don't want to know if you're transsexual. I do want to know if you've had difficulties, if you've had challenges that society has flung on you because of how you identify yourself or because of your sexual preferences or uh, how you choose to love. That I want to know. But I don't want to know what people call you. I just want to know who you are. And I. I think for me personally, that's a healthier way of approaching this society. We are all the same. And uh, that was what Tarindi said earlier as well. We are all the same. There isn't a difference. Uh, there might be biological differences or there might be uh, sexual preference differences. But when it comes to emotional, when it comes to um, personality, behavioral, there are no differences. So why label at all? Um, so that's kind of my point is that, uh, you know, we tend to either walk on eggshells and play a very, be very highly, I think, hypersensitized uh, to each other. And it's happening not only with the LGBTQI community, it's also happening with women's movements, you know, uh, when it comes to um, even women's rights uh, today, just, just to sort of draw parallels. It's like there's so much out there, there's so much talk and so much politics and sensitivity around it that sometimes we stop looking at each other as equals because, you know, this, this label is in front of us. Um, and if we are to move into an inclusive world, if we are to move into a world of equality, um, I think it's important for us to use the, that, that word, the LGBTQI or whatever the label is, as simply an identifier that is secondary to Mr. or Miss so-and-so, what their name is and who they are. And that should be the first thing that we know. That should be the first thing that we acknowledge. And then secondarily, oh, this is your preference in life. Uh, this is how you choose to live your life. That's great. Good on you. But this is who you are. And this is how you add value to my life. That would be my primary uh, importance. Um, and when we raise children in this world, we are raising children today, as opposed to how I was raised, we are raising children in a far more diverse uh, universe today because there are all these names and labels now, um, because there's a lot more sensitivity. We know a lot more. We didn't know, uh, everything was very binary back then. So we didn't really understand the intricacies and the complexities of people, uh, but now we do. And when we raise people, we raise young people in this world, um, I think we must not forget uh, that one universal truth, which is humanity. And every one of us has that. So uh, the label doesn't define who a person is. Uh, I think we need to start defining each other for our uh, our truth, our, our um, what's the word? I'm using the word personality too much, but our beliefs, our values, what makes us laugh, what makes us cry, the fact that we cry and laugh just like each other, the fact that we sh share the same um, blood groups. It, so when you look at it, things like that, it, there's really no difference. The fact that we're all skeletons with meat on top of it and blood circulating in us. Uh, and we breathe the same air, we drink the same water, we eat the same food, and uh, we love. And everybody loves. And it doesn't matter who I love to anyone else. And it shouldn't matter to me what, who anyone else loves. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's kind of as, as simple as I can. So we should really not be um, overly sensitive. Uh, and I apologize to anyone from the LGBTQI community who might think that that's offensive. But I really think that if I was overly sensitive to who they are, then I would treat them differently. I would treat them, maybe talk to them differently. Uh, that, and that is what happens sometimes. We avoid them because we're uncomfortable. 
for some strange reason, I know a lot of guys, straight guys, who are kind of almost threatened by gay guys or homosexual guys thinking that they're going to be preyed on, which is really foolish uh, because, you know, they're not predators. <laughs> if at all. They're, they're not. And um, so, so this label tends to make us behave differently, you know, and, and we avoid, we exclude, we isolate. Um, and sometimes, you know, we try to be overly friendly. Oh, oh, you're homosexual. Therefore, you know, you need special treatment just so that you know that I'm going to be politically correct to you. And that's awkward, right? You make a person feel very awkward. You make a person feel different uh, when you behave like that, uh, which is why I'm saying uh, forget the labels. Forget the identifiers uh, and just, just take it as, okay, I am a woman, I am a man, I am a homosexual, I'm an intersexual, I'm a, a pansexual, I'm a bisexual. Great. But who are you inside? And that's what I would focus on. Um, and in terms of sensitivity, in terms of how we treat each other, just like we treat each other every single day, like you treat your mother, father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, friend, that's who they are. Uh, yeah, that's what it is for me. Yes, um, a lot of relatable things about <laughs> how people perceive the LGBTQ community, like sometimes, yeah, brings a lot of memories also. So thank yeah. you. Um, I have one more question, Shanti, that I would like you to answer. Uh, mm -hmm. it comes to a, a bit more specific and a personal level. Uh, like yeah. a lot of us um, have friends who are um, belonging to the LGBTIQ community and like Karin B earlier said, there are myths and misconceptions and there's a lot of stigma and inherently since the society is a little bit reluctant and they like have all the lenses and colored glasses when you look at the LGBTIQ community, they might find this um, like coming out or being very open about their gender identity, sexuality, sexual orientation, it's difficult. So um, sometimes like it's all the more difficult if when you're coming out to your closest. So yeah. uh, what can we in like as maybe close friends, family, do to support a person who we know uh, or may have sensed uh, yeah. is struggling to come out um, and how can we support and what would be the best yeah. practice? Okay, first and foremost, this is a very personal journey to them. Okay, so we can't, and, and this is uh, similar for anybody who's going through anything, right? Uh, whatever your personal struggle is or your challenge is, it affects your own mental well-being in a unique way. Um, and so we have to understand that there is no one solution or one sort of protocol for how a person should come out. It depends on their, uh, obviously, their immediate ecosystem, their family environment, what kind of, you know, what kind of sociocultural environment they're growing up in. So all sorts of complexities, right? Um, so just because we saw somebody come out brave and bold in a privileged society or on, on Hollywood media doesn't mean that your friend will have the same experience. Doesn't mean your friend has that same privilege to find it that easy. So going up to a friend and saying, oh, don't be worried. You know, you come out, stand up for who you are. You go girl or you go guy, or, you know, like uh, we're here for you. It's, it's wonderful to give that support. It is heartening for them to know that you're there, but don't push them. Don't push them if they're not ready because there's so much of uh, struggle that they go to in internally as well. And we all do. We all do for something that we want to sort of tell the world or tell our closest when we think that we're going to be misunderstood or we're going to be criticized for it, right? Um, and really being pushed to do something that we are not ready to can create trauma, can create, you know, and, and then as friends, as supporters, you know, you might push them to come out and be open and uh, they trust you and they do it. And then what happens when their family rejects them or when society starts um, sort of isolating or, or you know, uh, when, when they get that kind of backlash, uh, how are you going to help them then? You know, so you have to be ready to support them right through the end. It's not just about come out, we root for you and we, we will wave a flag. It's about when you decide to wave that flag, when you decide to hold that hand, understand that it is for the long term. You don't teach your friends 
than when they need you afterwards. Because after coming out, as you said, society can be very cruel. Society can be very reluctant to accept because society is ignorant. Um, I think the first step is for us to also stop being ignorant when we go into this support role that we also need to be well informed. So if that means reading up, that means talking to your friend about uh, his or her unique experiences. Uh, if that means watching documentaries, going with them to counselors, you know, um, of course there is a personal journey, but if there is a way, they, if there is a need for them to, uh, for you to speak to a counselor with them to understand from uh, with the counselor's guidance also, what are the what are the things that you need to do or what are the things that you need to be for this person in their unique state of mind. Uh, to to sort of flourish, uh, then be there. And when, if and when there is some sort of backlash, be there to bail them out, be there to speak up. They need to feel supported. Anyone needs to feel supported. Again, I'm not making this only about the LGBTQI community, but I understand that they are a hugely marginalized community also because of ignorance, right? So, so when there is rejection, and it doesn't mean that it, only means when some some person comes and starts beating them up. It means if there is any sort of uh, intolerance or cruelty on social media towards their gender or towards them. Uh, if there's anything in a classroom, if some if there are jokes being said, you know how we're hypersensitized to sexist jokes today about women, right? And there are certain things that we are becoming less intolerant of, uh, less tolerant rather. Um, and we say that's not cool. That's harassing me, or or you're you're being sexist. This is a misogynist thing. So we are starting as a society. We are starting to identify the sensitivities and call it out. It's the same thing with the LGBTQI community. I I don't think it's only up to them to stand up for themselves and say, you know, don't say that to me, and I don't like it. You should be standing up for them as well. Uh, so for that, we need to be less ignorant ourselves. We need to know what are the triggers, what are the insensitive things that we also might not know, right? Because I mean, we we say things in passing, like as jokes and all, oh my God, that's so gay. But what do you mean that's so gay? What, what does that mean? What does gay mean? You know, it's almost like there's a stereotype then. So we also tend to do that with absolutely no harmful intention, but we do that. We stereotype, we belittle, we joke about it. Um, so I think we need to change our ways also. So that takes a lot of learning. And then in support, standing up, being there uh, and letting them know whilst you're not pushing them, they're allowed to take their time to come out. They're allowed to go through this journey in whatever way they want, but you are there. You are there as a friend, as someone that they would like to talk to, uh, a wingman, a wingman, if it must be, um, so that they know that at whatever point of time that they are never truly alone. And that is important for any human being to feel that support. Um, yeah, and I, and I think if there is a way, if there's enough trust built with their immediate family systems where you have uh, maybe you have some sort of influence over their family, over their siblings, over their friends. Uh, that is also a thing that you can use in your voice being heard when they are not, uh, where you can appeal to them. And, you know, building a community around them, getting other, it's not just you, you know, getting other like-minded friends, sharing the information that you know, changing other people's minds. Again, you don't have to be a part of, the LGBTQI community to be a part of that movement, right? It's all about supporting each other. It's like we need male allies to speak for females. We need straight allies to speak for LGBTQI people, cis cisgender people to speak for other genders. Um, yeah, uh, did that answer your question? Yes, yes, very much so. Um, so that also brings to uh, one final question from my side, uh, which I'll mm -hmm. um, direct to both of you, both Harindi and Shanuke. Uh, so for anyone who's curious to know more, or anyone who's looking for help, uh, help um, what are the resources? And uh, maybe there may be organizations who are working exclusively on this area or people who are experts. Um, like maybe websites where you can freely find accurate information because I understand that 
finding the accurate information is also mm. very vital to, to it because again there are, there are places and people websites information resources where there isn't necessarily a very accurate portrayal of this yeah, so yeah. what are the accurate sources organizations that you can reach of the trusted ones um, mm -hmm. or if you are looking for help or looking for more information um, from my side, as far as I'm aware, and I think Tarindi might know better than me, uh, but some of the resources that I would trust, uh, one is for statistics and for um, sort of uh, support, there is uh, bakamuno.lk that works with uh, a lot of different se segments, but also LGBTQI. Uh, there is, of course, uh, Equal Pride, which is an activist uh, organization that is working towards policy change as well as support and I think equal ground sorry not equal pride equal ground and they have uh, counseling services as well for anyone who's feeling confused about their identity uh, you know you can talk to them and they can take you through the resources that they have available um, you can talk to just counseling organizations like Shanti Margam who work with the youth on uh, mental well-being and that's not specific to lgbtqi but again if you are a young person who has gender related or sex sex related issues and um, you need to figure your life out or you need to work through some depression you're going through because of uh you know because of your uh gender identity places uh, like sumitri or shanti magam again counselors, psychological uh, helplines are there. Um, I think there is the Enable Foundation, which is also a foundation that works on diversity and inclusivity. Uh, there is the Sri Lanka Transgender Network. Uh, if you are someone who uh, believes you are in the wrong body. Um, so I think